Ladies and gentlemen, very nice and uh, small little crowd that we hope will still generate a lot of uh, interesting questions for us. Welcome to day two of the um, International Symposium on the Czech Foreign Policy. Today we start with a very, I would say, um, dynamic panel for me because it deals with the defense policy and we decided to bring uh, and some of you might recognize the faces from yesterday, people from across the world, Rosita Delios, who came from Australia, but will talk about Chinese uh, defense policy. So that's an interesting angle for us. And then, of course, we have uh, Michito Tsuroka from Japan, Mary Thompson Jones from United States, and Martin Michelot, who is sort of French Czech, uh, I would say, national for us, uh, currently based in Brussels. So we'll get I'm not sure exactly whether European or European angle, yes. So, very interesting, and I'm very grateful for the chair, Lukáš Dička, coming from Brno, because uh, he contributed uh, to this year's yearbook. The chapter on uh, defense dimension came from his uh, pen or p PC, keyboard, I don't know how he works and com prepares these documents, old school, new school. So enjoy, and then if you don't mind, we'll just shorten the coffee break to 15 minutes before our 50th anniversary Prague Spring panel. So I'll let Lukas deal with the logistics of this panel and discussions, and enjoy. Thank you very much, Dr. Kizakova. It was a very nice welcome, and I'd like to welcome you all as well. My name is Lukas Dička, and I'm from the University of Defense, which is in Brno, and it's the best military university in Czech Republic. It's also the only military <laughs> university in Czech Republic. And I'll be heading this panel, which will be dealing with uh, defense policy related issues. Uh, and I'm very happy that I can be here and I'd like to congratulate the Institute for International Relations for organizing this event. So congratulations. I hope more people will come, but still it's, it's very good, better than I would expect for the second day and morning. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm very happy that we have really global, uh, global partners in here and people from around the globe. Uh, so I will start with introducing Rosita Delios, who has been here yesterday, if I remember correctly. Uh, she's Associate Professor of International Relations at Bond University in Australia, and she lectures and writes uh, on themes of China's defense policy and strategic philosophy. I think for Czech Republic, Chinese issues are becoming more and more prominent, and we just discussed it in here. So having this, uh, this uh, insight will be very interesting for us. Second, and second speaker will be Dr. Dr. Michito Tsuroka, uh, and when I saw his bio, I was truly impressed because I've never seen anything so, so impressive, actually. Uh, he's associate professor at Cato University, and before that, he has been working on many, many places. You can read it in his CV. Sir, which one of the positions would you pick as the most important in your past? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, well, really, uh, uh, he's been working at the Ministry of Defense in Japan, and he has some experiences from Europe as well, and he studied in war studies uh, uh, from the King's College in London and so on, so really impressive bio. And the third speaker will be uh, Mary Thompson-Jones, on my right side, uh, is from the U.S., and she's a career diplomat and professor, and she's publishing a lot in, in U.S. foreign policy, and, uh, and her diplomatic experience is spent for 23 years, which is also impressive. Uh, and she's been posted to Canada, uh, see also the Guatemala, Spain, Washington, and so on and so forth. So I'll be, yeah, and Prague as well, of course. All right. So I'll be looking forward to that presentation. And last but not least, our Czech French friend, uh, Martin Michelot, who has just moved to Brussels, if I heard correctly, so he's not Czech anymore, but anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and he's going to be talking about PESCO. He's a deputy director of European Institute, European Institute and he'll bring the more regional topic, talking about PESCO, EU, and the relationship with NATO, and I, I believe he'll talk about also the influence on, on Czech Republic as well. And then in the end, I will be talking about purely regional, uh, local topic about Czech defense policy and how these influences and challenges that we get from the, from the globe, how they are impacting on our defense policy and what has happened in the past few years and what we should expect in the, in the coming years. So with that, uh, I'd like to start the, the panel and the discussion. I think, Rosita, the floor is yours. Uh, we have 10 minutes, so I'll be very much looking forward to that. Thank you, Chair. Ah, it's my first time in Prague, and it's a beautiful cultural city. Thank you to the organizers for bringing me here, and um, it's, it's been a very uh, enjoyable experience. For, I have eight um, points to make across three 
particular subheadings. And the, the subheadings are the uh, current state of affairs, with regard, I'm talking about China's defence policy and the, the current state of affairs, with regard to China's defence policy, uh, its prospects, and one lesson that I can, uh, within that 10 minute period. And um, with regard to the first point, Chinese defence policy is predicated on defence of the socialist political system. This makes the People's Liberation Army, which is inclusive of the Army, Navy, Air, Rocket and Strategic Support Forces, the, guarant the, the very guarantor of Chinese uh, communist rule, that is the Chinese Communist Party. And this is a very important point with regard to Chinese defence policy. In view of China being a People's Republic ruled by a Communist Party, its political system must also be defended. Uh, the party state is defended by the party army. This is evident um, in Chinese Communist Party constitution, official documents, and the allegiance of the armed forces to the party. Uh, political power did indeed grow out of the barrel of the gun, um, as Mao Zedong had famously observed, um, but he was always, uh, you know, this is the, the, the additional point that not everyone uh, knows, and that is that the party commands the gun. Um, it's noteworthy in an age of information-based capabilities requiring highly specialised professionals that the gun retain, retained its political name. The People's Liberation Army is the name, the official name of China's armed forces that uh, has been continued in this, con in this modern age. And it's the prefix for all the services and branches. Um, the Strategic Support Force was a recently introduced area which um, is keeping up with, uh, in order for China to keep up with modern technology and what it calls winning informationized local wars within a, co a continued active defense strategy which Mao had articulated way back then and which is being updated all the time, um, but maintaining its roots to the past. So there are the modern elements, but a, continua a continuation of past strategic thought. And if we may take it even further back to uh, Chinese strategic culture, there is a famous saying, value the martial and cultivate the civil. And this captures an essential relationship between hard and soft power. Now the martial is Wu, and it says in valuing Wu or martiality, China maintains in this age, in, in continuing this, the Chinese strategic culture, it maintains an independent nuclear arsenal and um, a, a huge armed force, which is 2.18 million active People's Liberation Army forces. So the PLA's active forces are not alone. They are supported by a reserve force of some half a million, a militia of 8 million, a People's Armed Police as well, um, conservatively estimated, you know, it's about perhaps a bit over half a million, but some people say, and it's often quoted as 1.5 million. Um, so there's a range of estimates there. And it's regarded as an internal army in the sense of, uh, again, to refer back to a Chinese philosophical strategic culture concept, the yin and yang. It's a sort of an internal yin to the PLA's external yang. And um, it's responsible for internal security and domestic stability. It's almost, it can be considered a second army. It does come under the authority of the Central Military Commission, um, though prior to 2017 it was under the dual command of the, um, both the Central Military Commission and the State Council, but now it's completely under the Central Military Commission. Um, it's removal from civilian control, like that of the Coast Guard, previously under the State Oceanic Administration, strengthens the um, CMC's role in China's security and hence party control over the armed forces, which takes us back to that original point, the um, political control of China's armed forces. In 2011, for the first time, the People's Armed Police, the internal force budget was, much, was higher than the PLA, and that's the official budget figures. It now exceeds um, the national defence budget by roughly 20%. It tells us the importance of internal security in China's defence policy. 
Xi Jinping, who's not only the President of China and General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, um, is, he's also the Chairman of, uh, of the party's Central Military Commission. And that's the highest command authority. And um, he's been restructuring the PLA to enable it to conduct modern warfare and protect China's global interests. If, however, the People's Armed Police finds itself strained to the limits in the event of domestic turmoil, an externally focused PLA would likely be returned to domestic duty. Um, and indeed, to this day, the PLA is expected to back up the internal People's Armed Police should that be required. The indoctrination of the People's Liberation Army is therefore all important for protecting the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. The lesson in that point is that we are talking about a party army. Um, the second point I want to make is that, but it is also, it is expected to be competent in modern warfare capable of uh, protecting China's expanding interests abroad and a contributor to global st stability through non-war missions like peacekeeping. Um, the challenge for others is that China can be offensive in pursuit of territorial claims such as the South and East China Sea. And um, this is part of its active defense um, strategy whereby it believes that um, it's acting in a defensive role overall but in an operational and tactical sense, it can be uh, quite assertive. So just the quick point there is that um, to back up that second point is land power is important to China because of its large territorial expanse, borders with many countries, a history of land-based threats and internal unrest, plus a revolutionary dependence on ground forces. However, China also has a significant coastline, global trade dependent on secure uh, sea lines of communication, um, maritime claims in South China Sea, and these claims are sufficiently um, secure through the construction of its, its, its actually feels secure now in the South China Sea with seven artificial islands and various military installations to provide China with the ability to project power beyond what's called the first island chain, which is, you know, from Japan through Philippines, Southeast Asia. Um, this projection beyond the coastline is uh, supported by a PLA Air Force and the newly upgraded PLA Rocket Force, which is a service in its own right now, uh, which has both conventional and nuclear components to it. The conventional missiles are for offensive operational missions. This has been clearly stated in, in China's de uh, defense white paper, um, as determined by the operational and tactical requirements of active defense. Uh, while the nuclear component is reserved for strategic counterattacks and is intended as a deterrent to nuclear attack. Um, um, among its additional missions, and the third point, is that uh, the benefit uh, of its, um, we can feel there is a benefit to China's additional missions because there is a desire to contribute to world peace by engaging in military operations other than war. This is stated that there are essentially the four key missions, the protection of the Communist Party rule, the protection of the homeland, the, ter the territorial, the, 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 the kind of defense that most people are aware of. Then there is the ex defense of expanding interests, which matches China as a growing power. And then there is the contribution to world peace. And this is a quote straight out of um, the missions that uh, China is expected to engage in. And um, prior to this articulation, uh, years gone by, we did not see much peacekeeping or much involvement beyond um, uh, Mao's more insular defense policy of being more um, uh, land forces. Now we are seeing China participating in a big way in peacekeeping. It has anti-piracy missions, Gulf of Aden, it's um, familiarizing itself with the Indian Ocean. Um, these things are new developments, but um, China wants to also have these missions, these um, non-war missions, and to be uh, engaged in military diplomacy. Um, the prospects section now is, I'm getting to point four and into looking into the future, um, and I'll quickly get through this because I'm aware of time. Um, power projection capabilities, especially naval um, 
and will be inclusive of bases. China needs to develop its bases to protect its expanding interests. China expects to become a modern socialist global power by the time of the PRC's centenary in 2049. Therefore, the core interests with which China articulates um, uh, are in keeping with um, expectations over the next three decades. These include the building of a world-class military with uh, uh, the preparatory f phase of modernization by 2035. China clearly fears uh, being left behind in military advances and seeks to ensure its defense needs are well catered for. Um, this means finding uh, the best mix in terms of technology and strategy uh, without foregoing the political loyalty of its forces in the process of improving um, their, their ex expertise in the art of war. Under Xi Jinping, the um, concur and concurrent uh, Belt and Road Initiative expansion across land and sea, China has rediscovered its maritime identity. I say rediscovered because Chiang He in the Ming Dynasty had the treasure voyages uh, where China was a, a great naval power in the 1500s, so it's rediscovered its maritime identity. Power projection capabilities have come to the fore in defence needs, and this involves all the services and branches which in any case are now expected to engage in integ integrated joint operations. Um, China, like other countries, now has a naval base in Djibouti and is likely to expand its bases in order to support its interests in the area, including shipping lanes, its engagement with Africa, and to safeguard its citizens and assets abroad. Um, AI technology advances for prospects, it's a big one. China has the slogan of winning informationized local wars, Xin Shi Hua, but is now, it's, it's adding the new slogan, intelligenceization. And this represents an opportunity to leapfrog uh, the achievements of the world's more technologically advanced militaries, though we await to see China's progress. Um, space and sa cyber capabilities are now overseen by the new strategic support force and are used as support for integrated joint operations. Space program is there. Um, China, there are many reasons for space programs. Um, practical but also prestige and China does pursue prestige as well um, and it's also uh, got um, the world's first quantum enabled satellite as part of the quantum um, experiments in space scale which Austria is also involved in. Um, such technology holds the potential for development of digital communication that cannot be hacked. The satellite is called Missius. Uh, it's a Latinized name for the ancient philosopher Mozart. Not many people know about him. He was an engineer but a great diplomat and a great um, peacemaker. He believed in peace and I think that's wonderful that has that name. China has been uh, exploring the moon for natural resources and here too the Chinese dream, as Xi Jinping called it, has extended. Uh, quickly, point six, counter-terrorism um, will become increasingly important in China's um, Belt and Road infrastructure projects. Um, this is uh, BRI, Xi Jinping's uh, most ambitious project and um, because of the internal problems in Xinjiang, um, with the Turkic Muslims, um, th th there's been a lot of trouble with um, maintaining security internally, but also China is making itself a target for external, um, in terms of infrastructure, in, case, um, in the case of terrorist attacks because of China's treatment of its Muslims. Um, this has already begun, this situation, and China is, has prepared itself. Um, so it's taking this very seriously. The West may want to see that China has got its own techniques of counter-terrorism and China is on board uh, with regard to stability maintenance, though not everyone agrees as to the methods used, particularly in the domestic scene. The external world is very critical at the moment of that. Uh, a lesson, and here I finish, uh, focus on cooperation for common security. Um, this is what Australia does. Australia has um, the USA as its, um, as its security partner and China as its primary economic partner. China and Australia exist in the same region. Um, America, of course, uh, has a presence the world over. Um, but Australia has a strategic partnership with China and it engages in joint military exercises to build transparency and trust. Um, 
China has been labelled a strategic competitor in the latest defence uh, strategy paper from America. China would not use that. Uh, Australia is very cautious as a middle power not to, to use such language, nor does Australia engage in freedom of navigation exercises. Um, it's trying to engage China. It's in Australia's interests to do so. Um, and, and then there's um, China should be involved in many um, cooperative arrangements as possible, in fact, um, so as to be uh, the closer you are integrated. Um, I do believe in engagement. The closer you're integrated, the more, in, in the, in, if those of you who are familiar with constructivist theory, the more you are impacting one another. And that is also within um, the scope of, of um, primary um, elements in Chinese philosophy that we are inter, uh, there's an intersubjective relationship between us. And it's not only between persons, it's also between nations. And we, we change one another through our uh, relationships, and I think that's very important. And we have got um, the, Kakadu, the Kakadu exercise, military exercise, where China came recently, and, and, and exercise with a number of regional countries that Australia hosted, um, and, and Antarctica, we have cooperation there. Uh, there's many things that we're, we're doing. Um, so to conclude, final statement, um, while Australia is a US ally, it promotes a wider concept of security that sees benefits in inclusion. China's defense policy, that aspect of China's defense policy which is interested in expanding its missions abroad uh, toward more um, uh, military operations um, that are not concerned with war but with um, productive exercises, then that is a good thing and that is what Australia and others um, are hoping China will focus on beyond a primary defence role. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Rosita. It was a pretty interesting presentation. Uh, I really love the way uh, the, the structure of the armed forces <coughs> and the police formations has been, has been painted. Uh, if I understood correctly, 8 million people in arms. Uh, it's really impressive. It's almost as many as, as, as there are people in Czech Republic. Uh, <laughs> and that that's really something incomprehensible for us. Uh, anyway, I think I have a question, and after I ask, uh, there will be a place for you, or time for you to ask questions as well. Uh, Rosita, can you tell us more about how to understand the Chinese uh, involvement in Russian, or recent Russian exercise, Vostok 2018? How, do, how should we understand it? Um, in the first place, this is not the first time China has exercised with Russian forces. The SCO, under the auspices of the SCO, it has been engaged in peace mission exercises, as they're called, um, across a long, long period of time. The Vostok 18, uh, yeah, the, the Vostok exercises, it was a relatively small contingent of Chinese, um, but they are there to learn. China has not had military experience. Its last war was in 1979. Russia has had military experience very current. So China is interested in that, in um, learning about this military experience through the exercise, in also showing um, its support across the Eurasian area of, it's, it's the, it's, although defense, military, it sounds scary, it sounds like war, it's actually highly symbolic. And these exercises, the bigger, the more symbolic they are. It's, it, I see it as Chinese opera, actually. You are putting on a show. And China wanted to show its solidarity, but at the same time, um, it was also showing that there is a geopolitical dimension to all of this. And uh, the, the Belt and Road and uh, the Eurasia economic area from, from the Russian perspective. They actually, Putin and Xi Jinping actually made a statement that uh, we are cohering, we are not in competition, uh, we are cooperating in this way. The word cooperation comes up a lot. Um, so I would say it was uh, some practical elements, learning what is going on with uh, modern warfare through a practiced power. Um, showing the geopolitical um, d uh, dimensions of this, because it was, you know, the eastern area, which both China and Russia um, are engaged in. 
and also with the SCO partners. Um, that's, that's an area of, of high importance, strategic importance. Um, and, and, um, and again, it wasn't um, a dangerous, China's participation could not be deemed a dangerous thing. China's troops have been overseas before in all of these missions. It's not a big deal, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have, uh, well, we have four or five minutes. It means that uh, there is a place for one, maybe two questions from the floor. Sir. Uh, Australia's largest strategic partner is the United States militarily. Correct, yeah. Their largest trading partner is China. Correct. Which do you see Australia would value more if push came to shove? Australia will look after its interests and it would look to a regional multilateral response. It would not choose, um, it will not be pushed into a situation of having to make an enemy of China. It will not be pushed into a situation of having to denounce the USA either. Tactically, Australia must maintain the rhetoric of its, um, it's very useful to, to Australia to have the USA as its strategic partner, but, and I won't even speak about plan Bs because things have happened already, Australia is a multilateral middle power. It is encouraging, and even this latest military exercise, the countries of the region to be together in a cooperative fashion in a, new, in a much broader, Australia has a very broad concept of security. It's gone beyond um, the old concepts and it's believing in having um, non-traditional security along with traditional security with many partners as um, a process. It will not choose uh, between China and America because that's a trap. And I, th I do believe China, uh, Australia's interests are being served by doing that. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? Okay, sir, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm from Embassy of Japan, Furugori. I have one question. As you said that uh, Xi Jinping is the highest commander of uh, Chinese arms force, but I wonder when I uh, I'm watching uh, what uh, what is happening in the uh, South, sea, uh, South China Sea, uh, whether the political sector uh, completely con uh, controls the uh, military sector. Uh, how do you uh, observe? Um, the South China Sea? Um, what did you say about China controlling? Uh, uh, South China Sea. What is happening in the South China Sea? I wonder that the uh, polit political sector of the chi uh, China uh, completely con uh, controls the uh, military sector. I don't think... Um, what China has... Again, this is a bit like the Chinese opera. It's made a lot of, this is at the operational and tactical level, active defense. It wants to show that it has capabilities in the South China Sea, but China would not start a war in the South China Sea. It wants to have an exhibition. It has on the ground dredged and created islands. Um, it's diminished. The USA feels it's got everything under control, but the perceptions that China is working on through these physical acts on the South China Sea, the perception is that China is strong, that it, America can't go where it likes or it needs to take, pay attention to China at least. Um, but I honestly, do, I think it is all about appearances. There would not be a war in the South China Sea. No one can afford a war in the anywhere at this moment. Um, there was dis discussion that perhaps that will be where the war is, or in the second island chain where Guam is, in order to protect, um, you know, the, China would have a, a, you know, a moat, if you like, to protect itself. Um, but that's no good for Australia, because we are on the second island chain with Darwin, and there's Guam there, Japan at the top. Um, I don't think that the South China Sea is setting up this particular scenario of warfare. It is to demonstrate that China is a growing power. It has its rights. Um, I personally think it could have been done differently. It could have been done much more diplomatically. Um, but Xi Jinping has an approach that's different to Hu Jintao before him. 
Xi Jinping wants to show that China is a strong country that's returned to its past glory. Um, in Chinese philosophy, that was called the legalist philosophy, where the strong country, uh, which, which has other elements, it still has the Confucian and then the Taoist elements, but it's the strong country, it's the realist perspective, and he wants to show that China is now arriving, we have the plans, we can, we can do this. He's doing it for a reason, because this is the season for China to show who it is. Um, if, if we engage in diplomacy and give China respect and engage all the time, I don't think things will go wrong. And it's very much up to the USA to be very wise about this situation. Um, no one should be firing the first shot. It is dangerous, though, if they did. Thank you, Rosita, and thank you all for your questions. I think there is much to say about the, the, the China and the, and the influence of China on not only Australia. Luckily, we have another speaker, uh, Dr. Tsuroka, who will also be talking, I believe, a little bit about China, and he'll be talking from the Japanese per, uh, perception. So, sir, the floor is yours. Okay, oh, thank you very much, and thank you very much again for the invitation. I very much enjoyed uh, yesterday's session, and uh, I am very grateful for the very kind uh, hospitality. Um, the, let, let me start by saying a few words about uh, the regional uh, security situation in the Asia-Pacific region before talking more specifically about uh, Japan's defense posture. Uh, and first, North Korea. Yes, of course, the, the, interest is, the level of interest is quite high, and uh, we've just seen the, the uh, South North uh, Summit meeting in Pyongyang, but uh, to be quite honest, perhaps including myself, very few experts are optimistic about the prospect of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. In terms of capability, so the ICBM, the intercontinental ballistic missile capability, as well as the, the nuclear weapon capability, haven't changed at all. So the, at least for the moment, despite the political grandiose rhetoric about uh, denuclearization, what we have to do is to live with North Korea, which is already a nuclear weapon state, or at least country having nuclear weapons. So this situation is going to continue at least for some time. So some people now say that uh, by the end of the first uh, Trump administration, the denuclearization is going to be complete. Very few people believe that way, but uh, still, January 2021, so there, st there is still some time. So at least in the meantime, we have to live with a nuclear-armed North Korea. So our challenge is, is to deter nuclear North Korea. So the, while at the same time, while talking about denuclearization, we have to think about how we can deter North Korea in the meantime. So there's no contradiction between the two. That is a very inconvenient reality, but still, we have to live with that. As for China, yes, the, one of the biggest problems of our high level of attention to North Korea has been that uh, we tend to forget about China. But the China, China's activities and China's uh, assertiveness, particularly in the maritime domain in the South China Sea as well as in the East China Sea, hasn't changed. So the, the Chinese ships are coming to the, to the to the East China Sea, close to Japanese territorial waters, and sometimes in the territory, in the Japanese territorial waters, and the Chinese aircraft coming on a regular basis to close to the Japanese uh, airspace, so we scramble, and uh, so, so on a daily basis we are uh, Japanese to address uh, Chinese challenges, particularly in the East China Sea areas. So the North Korea, China, and uh, that, sounds enough, but uh, we should not forget about Russia. Of course, in Europe, no one forget about Russia, but uh, in, in talking about Asian security, sometimes we, we, we forget about Russia, but uh, the Russia is, has, been, uh, ha has been doing military build-up in the Far Eastern region as well, including in the Northern Territories. Uh, the, that's, uh, from our point of view, that's uh, part of Japan, but uh, they're occupied by, by Russia for many, many years. So they, in those, the one or two of those islands, and the Russians have been increasing uh, its uh, military posture. So that, that is something the, the, that uh, Japan is in, becoming 
increasingly concerned about. And uh, so, so essentially that uh, Asians are always talking about China and the Europeans are always talking about Russia. So it might sound legitimate for us to say that uh, Europe and Asia are facing different challenges. So there aren't many things in common for us to talk about. But uh, the, from my point of view, and actually I would like to call your attention to the fact that uh, there are various commonalities between Asian uh, security theater and that in Europe. And the first is the, the challenge of the change of state of school by force or coercion. So the, in the South China Sea, yes, the China has been doing this, but uh, in the Crimea and in eastern part of Ukraine and the Russian actions have been more, more violent than what China has been doing. So the change of status quo by force, how we can address this challenge, and that's uh, one of the, that, that's the first uh, sort of a common um, challenge that Asians and Europeans are facing. And the second is, uh, has to do with the hybrid warfare. So the, we've been talking a lot about hybrid warfare, particularly after the, 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 the annexation of Crimea by Russians. But uh, this is also quite familiar challenge for Asians for many years, that China has a concept of three warfares, psychological warfare, media, public opinion warfare, and legal warfare. So the, this is a sort of a hybrid warfare type of thing, and in the Japanese uh, defense discourse, we often use the term gray zone contingencies. It's below the threshold of war. So the, this is also something that uh, the, the, the challenge that uh, the Europeans and Asians have in common. And uh, the another and a common challenge is about the A2 AD, the anti-access area denial capability. So the Russians and Chinese have been quite uh, eager to strengthen anti-access area denial capability. It is about preventing Americans from intervening. So for China, of course, the, the, the most important area of concern is the, the cross-strait relations between mainland China and Taiwan. So how to prevent Americans from intervening should crisis happen, and that, that is a huge concern. But Russians, for, for Russians, and the, the Kaliningrad, and the Crimea, and now even Syria, they have been establishing its A2AD capability. So, the how to, so, so from our point of view, how to counter uh, Russians and the Chinese uh, A to AD capability. That, that, that is a quite uh, a, a common concern. So it, in those areas, the, from a Japanese point of view, what is quite interesting and uh, a big concern about is what Chinese can learn lessons from Russia. So the hybrid warfare, change of status quo by force, or the A to AD capability. So the, it looks like uh, that the Russians are more advanced in various respects, and the Chinese are quite eager to learn lessons from China. So in this context, uh, the, the, let me say a few words on uh, Japan's uh, response and Japan's defense posture response. And the first is to strengthen the alliance with the United States. That's uh, something I discussed yesterday. And also, the, we've been trying to strengthen our own defense posture particularly the ballistic missile defense capability, and we are going to, to introduce a new land-based uh, system called Aegis Ashore. And amphibious capability is something that uh, we are now starting to invest more. And the cyber defense capability, and, uh, and the, the government uh, led by Prime Minister Abe has just uh, started a process of drawing up a new defense document called the National Defense Program Guidelines, uh, NDPG, and uh, we are supposed to adopt a new this uh, document by the end of this year, where the the idea of cross domain is the is the sort of buzzword in this process. So the how to how we can integrate various domains, so land, maritime, air, as well as cyber and space, outer space. So the cross domain thing is it's it's something that we are now very much working on. And beyond those uh, own defense posture and the alliance with the United States, uh, the, the another area that Japan is now uh, expanding, uh, the, 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 the putting resources on, is the defense engagement and defense diplomacy. 
in the, particularly in the South, Southeast Asia, so the ASEAN countries, and uh, we, we have been doing various uh, the, the engagement activities, including capacity building assistance to Vietnam and uh, Philippines and other the Southeast Asian countries. And beyond that, the, the one of the things that uh, Japan is now promoting is the idea of free and open Indo-Pacific, FOIP. The, the engagement in the Indian Ocean is something that uh, we are becoming more serious. So some people say that uh, this is all a effort to contain China, but uh, from my point of view, what we are trying to do is much more than that. So the, the engagement uh, with India and Australia, and sometimes in the framework of a quad, US, Japan, Australia, India framework. So this is very much about uh, the, the defending the, the rules-based international order broadly. And the Japan's engagement in the in Indian Ocean is also quite interesting in terms of thinking about Europe, Asia, or Europe, Japan cooperation, because the Indian Ocean is somewhere between Europe and Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you, or f thank you, above all, for sticking up to the time. Uh, it was very precise. Uh, I think that there are so many questions to ask, but I think the most relevant question I wanted to ask any Japanese for last year was how do you see the Trump and, and Kim uh, meeting a few couple of months ago? What can we take from that? But how should we understand it? Yes, the one, perhaps Japanese, are the most skeptical people among the, all the relevant countries. But uh, the one thing I have to say is that uh, compared to last year's situation where the tensions were really high between the US and North Korea, and people are seriously concerned about a possibility of war between the US and North Korea, compared to that, the current situation is much better. But at the same time, the, it looks that the American approach is a sort of appeasement. And uh, the nightmare for Japan is that Americans and North Koreans agree on something at the expense of Japanese interest. And we are very much concerned about that, and that is why the, we have been uh, quite serious in, in putting our input on the, on, on the US regarding its, uh, its, its North Korea policy. But uh, I, I think that uh, the, 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 it's one, one, the one thing that Japan needs to do is to remind not just Americans, but also South Koreans, that in terms of capability, nothing has changed. And uh, as long as this process of denuclearization continues, we need to think about effective deterrence posture vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. So these are, I think, are just a very realistic and starting point to think about this. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think we have a time for one question. Sir, please. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, look, um, I want to follow up on your observations of um, North Korea. Uh, when or if the Trump administration is unable to solve the denuclearization problem, uh, would there be a likelihood or an emerging consensus in Japan to acquire its own nuclear weapons and take care of itself? Okay, thank you very much. Um, in theory, as an expert working on this field, yes, there, there should be more discussions, more serious discussions about this. But uh, in practical terms, there is zero possibility for Japan to go nuclear for various reasons, the domestic politics and international relations and economic cost, blah, blah, blah. So the, yes, the, as a, as a, in, in part of logical discussions about Japan's options, yes, the, the nuclear option is always there, in theory, but in reality, there is zero percent. And the situation hasn't quite changed over the past uh, 10 years or so, but the, 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 the most important uh, precondition for, for me to say so is the US-Japan alliance. So the if and when the credibility of extended deterrence of the United States collapses, then 
there's going to be a whole new situation where we might have to think about uh, going nuclear. But uh, at least for the moment, the, w from my point of view, what is more important than talking about nuclear option is to maintain the alliance with the United States. That has always been the most effective uh, security tool for Japan. Thank you for the question, and also I'm very happy that it was uh, related to the United States because uh, it gives me a chance to bridge it with the another speaker, Dr. Mary Thompson Jones, and her topic dealing with the Trump administration and U.S. issues and so on and so forth. So, floor is yours. Please take take ten minutes. And looking forward to that. Thank you. Uh, I'll be speaking this morning uh, under my own name. Uh, so my views don't necessarily reflect those of the U.S. government, although it's impossible to have worked so long for the U.S. government and not be affected by that. Uh, I also come here, as I said yesterday, with a lot of humility and a lot of gratitude for the chance to have worked in this country on two separate occasions for two tours. I have a lot of affection and a lot of regard for the Czech Republic. Uh, keeping with the global outlook of this panel and with great appreciation for my colleagues who have already spoken, I'd like to shift this tour d'horizon and move it a bit uh, to the north of Europe. And I'd like to start out by reading you a short quote as follows. From my perspective, Russia is the main challenge. Russia challenged the European security order. This has a destabilizing impact in Northern Europe and beyond. These are the words of the Swedish Minister of Defense, Peter Hultqvist. Uh, he made this, these remarks in April of this year when he met with Jim Mattis, our Minister of Defense in Washington, DC. I'd like to stay with Sweden for a moment. Uh, Sweden, as you all know, is a long-standing neutral power in the north of Europe, uh, a stalwart member of the European Union. But Sweden recently reinstituted conscription. Sweden recently purchased Patriot missiles from the United States. Sweden recently began production of 60 new Gripen fighters, not for export, but for its own use along with the building of a couple of A-26 submarines. In terms of Sweden's thoughts about potential NATO membership, once an unimaginable idea, recent opinion polls show that the mood of the Swedish people has shifted to mid-40s. One poll showed 47% in favor of full NATO membership. Some would argue that Sweden already has, as good as, become a NATO member through something called Enhanced Opportunities Partnerships. This allows Sweden to do a lot of exercises and a lot of uh, military participation with NATO. Sweden clearly is worried. Norway, which is a NATO member, now has U.S. Marines that participate every year in high north exercises. This is to the benefit of U.S. Marines who seek out this kind of training, but it's also to the benefit of Norway, which requested that the Americans send uh, a new complement, increasing the number of Marines in Norway from 330 to well over 700. Iceland, one of the smallest NATO member countries, who had closed its military base, Keflavik, which Americans largely ran, has recently welcomed back Navy Poseidon 8A anti-submarine uh, aircraft as an effort to close something called the GI-UK gap, Greenland, Iceland, UK gap in the North Sea. Uh, I could go on, Denmark, uh, has an interesting situation right now with Greenland. Uh, some would call Greenland Europe's last colony. Greenland has independence in all but defense and foreign policy areas, and Greenland has political parties that are agitating for full independence from Denmark. Denmark, of course, is another stalwart NATO ally, but it remains to be seen if Greenland achieves full independence, what will happen there. 
This is newly important because of climate change and because of what's going on in the Arctic Ocean, one of the world's smallest and least known, least charted oceans. Sweden, Finland, United States, Canada, Denmark, and of course, Russia are all Arctic Council members, all nations that border on the Arctic Ocean. And as we look, as the organizers of this conference prodded us to do, to defense challenges in the future, the Arctic Ocean is inescapably one of those. And this is not a select club of just the eight nation states that I mentioned. China, as my colleagues probably know too well, considers itself a near Arctic state and has recently issued its first Arctic white paper. Japan is active in the Arctic, as is South Korea, India. We heard from uh, an expert on India yesterday. Many other European near Arctic states have become newly interested in the Arctic as the waters there become newly navigable. This raises all kinds of security concerns and brings us back to the point that I began my talk with about understanding the Russian threat. Russia is perhaps the original Arctic nation and the nation with the most claim to the Arctic, having more than 50% of the Arctic coastline. It also has much of the population of about 4 million people who live above, north of the Arctic Circle, happen to be Russian, the largest cities in the Arctic, Murmansk, uh, to name one, are Russian cities. Russian has, Russia has the largest navy, the largest military presence, and one which it has recently invested in growing. Canada's the second largest. Canada has not invested much in its Arctic coastline, it has an Arctic patrol, the members of whom still carry World War II era rifles. The United States has not much to talk about, although we have 1,100 miles of Arctic coastline, thanks to Alaska and our northern slope. We tend to look at the Arctic from a commercial industrial point of view, and I've been slow to see this as a security challenge. So my question, which we can talk about later, is for all the NATO members, when we get off the 2% issue, and sorry for that, uh, when my Japanese colleague referred to de defense diplomacy, I was thinking we could learn a thing or two and learn to be a little bit more diplomatic about how we talk about the 2%. Uh, the ambivalence about Russia's intentions is something that needs to be discussed. Russia is a major foreign investor here in the Czech Republic, elsewhere in Europe. Russia is a major investor in the Arctic and in the high north. What is NATO's approach to Russia? Where do we see this heading? And how will we respond to Russia's increasingly obvious intent to militarize the Arctic Ocean? Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and I think it was very interesting for us to hear about the region that is so close to Czech Republic and yet uh, so omitted from the discussion here in Czech Republic as well. And it was very illustrative for me and you painted a very nice picture of that. Uh, but you mentioned the 2% and of course I need to ask about it. Uh, and you mentioned President Trump only once, so I hope you will mention him more. Uh, how should we read his uh, rhetorics vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 2% uh, GDP on defense? Uh, is it something new in, in U.S. policy or only the rhetorics is new? Should we expect something bad to happen in future if we don't follow 2%? Can you touch on that issue, please? Of course. Uh, I don't believe in the 2%. I think it's a poor metric. Uh, some countries have, in fact, achieved the 2% goal. But it begs the question, 2% on what? Germany was clearly the target of Trump's ire. And Germany could easily achieve the 2% by giving everyone in the MOD a raise. Uh, done. <laughs> Other countries could meet the 2% by buying every member, man, woman, of their armed forces a new uniform. Does that make NATO more secure? Does that make us sleep better at night? I don't think so. Uh, one aircraft carrier would meet the 2% challenge. Is that strategically where we want to put NATO's maritime efforts? 
there's not a lot of strategic thinking behind the 2%. There's a lot of politics behind it. And to be fair to the Trump administration, hard as that may be, uh, Obama raised this as well. And in one of his interviews with the New York Times, he said he was really griped by the free riders who'd gone along for so many years having saved on military spending in order to increase social spending and that it was becoming harder and harder to explain to the American people. Trump made, for lack of a better word, a social compact with the people in the United States who felt left behind by globalization, by economic development. I mentioned yesterday, and I won't reiterate, that there are many right-wing politicians in European states, Western European states, NATO member states, who've also made common cause on this issue. I think the point has been raised, the point has been made. We need to move on and talk about substantive and strategic issues. I'm a committed transatlanticist, as are many, many Americans. We are here for, forever in Europe, and we believe in Article 5. So with or without the 2%, NATO will go on. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I myself, as working for the defense sector in Czech Republic, would very much like to subscribe to the idea of giving everyone raise in the defense sector and thus reaching the 2%. Uh, but thank you for that. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we have time for questions. So anyone who wants to ask Mary, the floor is yours. What do you think it would take for the United States to begin to look at the Arctic as strategically as Russia does instead of just commercially and industrially as you said it currently does now? I think it'll take a lot. Uh, the military and defense appropriations bill that Congress just dealt with had a line item for one icebreaker for the U.S. Coast Guard. We split the duties in the Arctic between the Coast Guard, which has search and rescue and civilian type capabilities, and increasingly with the U.S. Navy. We are waiting for the U.S. Navy to publish its new Arctic white paper. Uh, the Navy reactivated its second fleet, which is a good sign because this is the fleet that's positioned uh, to work in the North Sea. So there is some belated recognition that, oh, we should be there. I think the industrial complex is way ahead of the American military complex. Alaska, in a lot of Americans' minds, is sort of a forgotten state. And if we think of it all, we think of it in terms of oil, natural gas. The fact that the Arctic is now opened again for drilling is of interest to us. We don't have a large population up there. And they have not held a lot of political weight. It will take members of Congress, we have both the Alaskan and the state of Maine delegations seized with this issue. They don't have a lot of heft in Congress, but there's starting to be a lot more conversations. It, it, the Arctic was missing from President Trump's national security strategy. It got very little mention in his national military strategy, so we're not seeing yet a lot of administrative uh, recognition of this, but the services are starting to see it, and the commentariat, uh, such as they be, are writing about it more, people are visiting it more, because as it's possible to get up there and visit it, writers are going, political analysts are going, members of Congress are going, and the more that happens, the better. The Greenland issue could push America to act, so there are some interesting possibilities there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, another question, sir? Just uh, very quickly, what is the US view of the role of the Arctic Council or its limitations in relation to easing some of these tensions in the north? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, the US and the other seven littoral states that I mentioned, including Sweden and Finland, are Arctic Council members. Uh, I think it depends on whether or not we have a bilateral president uh, such as Donald Trump or a multilateral president such as Obama. The U.S. last had the council presidency in 2006 and it had a committed agenda, achieved the polar code, which was a major outcome and an extraordinary achievement from a 
multilateral organization in which industry committed to significant limitations in terms of their conduct and exploitation of the Arctic Sea and Arctic resources. So on the good side, the United States has not only seen the value of the Arctic Council, but exerted leadership and used it to what I think most people would see as good concrete ends. The downside of your question, of course, is that we're now in an era in which we have a, an administration that prefers bilateral rather than multilateral relationships, who seems not to value the give and take and the diplomatic rough play of multilateral organizations. So I don't expect in the remaining two years to see a lot of new initiatives coming out of the Trump administration, unless prodded to do so by Congress, in which case we'll have to wait until November and see what kind of a Congress we've got. Thanks. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you all for the questions. Uh, I think we really need to hear more about the U.S. Uh, defense policy and U.S. Uh, Trump's policy in, in, in coming years. It's influencing us all in Europe, and I'm glad that our last speaker, at least before me, uh, will talk about the European perspective and PESCO, which is something that's uh, you know heavily prominent in, in, in recent political debates. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I represent uh, the European Institute for European Policy, which is a, a EU affairs uh, think tank. So of course, uh, I have to come here and uh, give you an update uh, on the latest uh, progress uh, in uh, EU defense uh, cooperation and, uh, and, and integration. Uh, and basically, I just want to start with a, you know, sort of a small metaf metaphor and just talking about the teething issues uh, of EU defense because I think this is actually the most, the most relevant one. Uh, there was a lot uh, of, of uh, excitement, a very big momentum that was created in late 2017 and the, the whole uh, ongoing year uh, about the new elements uh, of EU defense uh, cooperation. But right now, uh, I think that uh, the, the European Union and its member states are very much in that teething phase. And uh, to uh, continue with the metaphor, uh, just like a visit uh, at the dentist, when you have teething issues, it may be painful, uh, but it is uh, necessary. So basically, I just want to structure my, uh, my points on uh, three points on how to manage expectations uh, and also discussing the political military challenges uh, on the uh, on the road the first point uh, really is re related uh, to the eu capability development and i'm very glad that we had a small uh, discussion about the uh, about the 2% uh, because this is this is at the end uh, extremely extremely relevant so um, recently the EU has made uh, quite important strides uh, on both ends and ways for greater cooperation in the, uh, in the area of defense. Very quickly on the ways, uh, the European Union Global Strategy, which was published now uh, two year, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, indicates that the Union must develop full spectrum capabilities as part of its overall approach to foreign and security policy and that it must systematically encourage defense cooperation and strive to create a solid European defense industry. That's for the ways. On the means, this is where it gets a bit more uh, complicated, uh, and this is where we get into the, uh, the alphabet soup uh, of EU defense uh, cooperation. And here on, on the means, there is still some ways to go uh, before, the, before the EU has defense capabilities that, is required, that are required to meet uh, its, its strategic uh, objectives. And right now, the EU is in the process of basically uh, figuring out how the different tools uh, it, it created, uh, the development of over the coordinated annual review on defense, which well, I will call for CARD, the European Defense Fund, uh, and, and PESCO. I mean, there are real challenges, and I will just try to quickly delve uh, into how, into the interplay uh, between, these, uh, between these, these elements. So um, the, the European Union recently published its, its capability uh, development plan, uh, and it's fair to say that this uh, capability development plan has evolved in the light of the strategic, technological, and policy developments uh, of, the, uh, of the last few years. Uh, and I think this year it is absolutely uh, crucial uh, to look at this CDP, the capability development plan, as a vital element uh, of the EU's broader defense uh, policies because of the important and key role it plays in arbitrating between short-term capability requirements and longer-term capability industrial uh, and technological uh, needs. And in my mind, uh, in, in 2018, uh, the, the, the CDP creates extremely high stakes for EU capability development uh, because for the first time, the CDP is actually linked uh, to, uh, to capability output. This 
you know, sounds stunning from a national perspective, but from an EU perspective, uh, this is very much uh, a first. Uh, and then, in terms of the uh, of, of linkages with the uh, with the other instruments, this is where this is where the the, the discussion is is key, but perhaps the most difficult. Uh, the PESCO permanent structured uh, cooperation has set binding commitments and has put in place capability projects uh, to ensure more structured cooperation over specific areas uh, over the the long term. Secondly, uh, there are investments that will be made under the European Defence Fund jointly by the European Commission and participating member states, uh, which will give member states a greater incentive uh, to collaborate with each other on defence research and capability programmes. And uh, thirdly, the coordinated annual review uh, on defence will in time lead to a more complete picture uh, of Europe's capability uh, landscape. So when you try to put all of this together, you understand how the capability development plan of the European Union can actually link uh, all these elements uh, together uh, with CARD informing member states on an annual basis of the capability requirements that it still needs uh, to, uh, to, to meet. But this is just for the alphabet soup uh, part. Now in the more strategic uh, long-term uh, planning, there is one major challenge that the EU uh, is facing today. And that involves having to fill a multitude of capability shortfalls in the short term while also thinking uh, about what future capabilities and what future technologies the EU member states will need and want uh, to, uh, to, to invest in. And here there is a, a real uh, conundrum. Uh, Opt-in only to fill uh, capability shortfalls uh, may result in clear industrial costs later on, but at the same time only investing uh, in future capabilities uh, and uh, will uh, meet, will, will sap the resources uh, that uh, EU member states may have had or may have had already a hard time uh, committing. So uh, there is very much uh, of, you know, this, this exercise of trying to find uh, a, a right balance, which is absolutely vital uh, to the EU's ability to finally field uh, full spectrum capabilities and to enhance its military uh, and industrial strategic autonomy. Uh, and of course the concept itself of strategic autonomy is one that is fairly controversial right now at the regional level in Central Europe but also still within the, uh, within the European Union. So um, this is, this is you know, the, the heart uh, of the European debate and the difficulty uh, of the European debate right now is really linking uh, all these uh, instruments with one another. And you know, I cannot underscore the immensity of uh, such a challenge uh, at a time when uh, uh, Mr. Dichka uh, reminded you know, how this is actually pushing back the boundaries of EU cooperation at a time when nationalist, uh, populist forces are actually very much challenging the very existence uh, of the, the project uh, of the European Union. And uh, to an extent, uh, if you take away the more nationalist part, this is extremely relevant uh, from the, the, the whole project, the whole cooperation is extremely important for countries like the Czech Republic, which is at the heart uh, of, of the European Union. Uh, the Czech Republic is a uh, medium-sized country with uh, very important gaps uh, in, its, uh, in, its, in its armed forces and it's countries such as the Czech Republic that actually have the most uh, to gain from the increasing regionalization and integration of defense policy. They also have more to gain in terms of more efficient uh, joint uh, procurement. Uh, but also in the current structure, if you look at, industri at industrial priorities, is also uh, the, the country whose uh, defense technological and industrial base has the most uh, to, uh, to lose from losing, you know, extremely valuable uh, know-how uh, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, of capability development, given how the structure of the European Defense Fund will disproportionately favor um, companies uh, who come from bigger countries and who, are, who have the ability to capture uh, very important research uh, and development uh, funding, which is the, the whole purpose of the European uh, Defense Fund. This is one, one, one big challenge for, the country, for a country such as the, the Czech Republic. The second uh, is, a bit more, is a bit more structural and perhaps more institutional. It's also that uh, entering these new formats uh, of cooperation at the political military level requires a type of cooperation between the Ministry of Defense, the armed forces, the general staff that uh, is not typical in a country such as the Czech Republic and perhaps here 
uh, Lukas Dicka can say something about this, uh, but we saw when uh, in the, the onset uh, phase of, of PESCO that there was a very hard time communicating ambitions and turning them into political uh, reality. So this is something that is, that is in my mind uh, extremely, uh, extremely interesting. Uh, since we're a bit short on time, uh, I think the EU NATO discussion we had uh, we had a bit, and I'll touch on it just just very quickly. Uh, but I think uh, another point that I want to make is really on managing uh, the the expectations. I mean, we are at a moment when we've had the German foreign minister, the French president, say in all but uncertain terms that uh, the United States can no longer be uh, relied upon. And there are various you know, rhetorical uh, proclamations uh, of this, which all uh, end up at the, with, with the same conclusion, is that uh, Europe, uh, it's, it's, it's high time for Europe to be able to have its, its strategic uh, autonomy. But I think we need to be honest in terms of communication towards towards the public, to communication towards citizens, also in managing expectation, the expectations towards what the EU can actually uh, deliver on. Uh, and I will not be uh, giving out any new information by saying that capability uh, development projects take an extremely long uh, amount of time. The much vaunted project right now uh, at the European level uh, is the next generation uh, combat aircraft. Uh, and this is really the true, the true case in point. If there were an industrial consortium uh, to emerge from this, uh, and in which case it would have to encompass a very large part, if not all, of the European uh, defense industry, uh, this would of course be a, an emblematic achievement uh, for European defense integration. But uh, in reality, the timeline that we're talking about uh, for you know, str important strategic, strategic enablers such uh, as next-gen uh, combat aircraft is the 2040s uh, at, the, uh, at the earliest, if work were to start on it uh, in the next uh, couple of years. And I think you know, this is precisely the point uh, to, be, uh, to, to be emphasized in my mind. It is exactly because of the long timelines uh, of, of the work of capability development projects that the work must be started in earnest on this uh, as, as soon as possible. And in my mind, this is actually the benchmark against which the success or failure of PESCO and all the other uh, elements of defense cooperation that I've mentioned will be, will be judged against. Basically, the question is, uh, if, we look, uh, if we ask the question that we can ask today, is significant capability development projects have been launched in three to uh, five years uh, from now on, in which case they will actually answer uh, lots of the elements uh, in the EU's uh, CDP. So this is really just the, the political landscape in which you can uh, envision uh, all, all of these projects. Uh, we're talking about long term, we're talking about complicated institutional uh, procedures, which the EU for all intents and purposes is very comfortable with. But uh, this is the political landscape in which you have uh, you, in political landscape in which you can read uh, the French desire to have more uh, intimate uh, cooperation formats. Case in point is a European intervention initiative, or uh, more recently, President Macron uh, announcing his desire uh, to create uh, a uh, standing uh, force that would be able to answer contingencies linked to Article 42.7 of the European Treaty, which is the mutual solidarity clause uh, of the uh, of the European Treaty. So this is, you know, one of the uh, one of the very interesting uh, discussions is also, you know, what happens at the sub uh, EU level. And then there are still challenges to be faced at the European Union level because it's it's nice to have all these all these formats of, of cooperation, but there's still other institutional uh, issues uh, to be solved. The financing of EU operations uh, is 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 a key one, uh, but then you also have uh, other more intricate questions such as uh, the connection between the existing uh, tools uh, of force projection uh, of the European Union, uh, you know, the rapid reaction force uh, of the European Union, the battle groups uh, of the European. European Union, they are all part uh, of, the, of, of a toolkit, but we're still, you know, very much waiting for a, a political uh, political dynamism uh, behind this. So basically, to end uh, on my uh, on my original uh, metaphor. Uh, since the EU is uh, still in the teething phase, I do recommend you know regular dentist uh, visits, and perhaps uh, at some point a brace uh, will be necessary to hold uh, everything uh, everything together. I did not touch on uh, EU NATO cooperation, but I, uh, this is something that we can uh, discuss further. 
Thank you, and thank you for the metaphor. I'll, I think I'll copy it and use it myself. So, no, very nice one. Thank you for that. And I have a question which our soldiers in the course of the general staff, in which I'm teaching, uh, are discussing pretty heavily uh, during the last uh, last few weeks. Uh, do you think that PESCO is a one, uh, one step towards the European army? Is it desirable to reach this level of you know, having the common European army or not? No. <laughs> it's, 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 I've, I've, of course, um, no. I don't think it's uh, it's, it's politically uh, desirable, uh, and uh, I think that if you look at the uh, main uh, military forces of the uh, of, of the continent, uh, I do not think there is any desire for a European army uh, in Paris. Uh, certainly not, because um, lots of countries want to, <coughs> very large extent, pre preserve their uh, strategic uh, autonomy, and France is, is, is one of them. Uh, and uh, behind this, this is informed by a certain amount of, of doubt as to, uh, uh, of doubt, and it's also informed by the you know, previous uh, discussions at the European level. Uh, for example, when there was uh, the, the Conference of Generation of Forces for the mission in Mali, for the mission in Central African Republic, uh, there was you know, certain reluctance uh, of other countries to uh, engage into this. The generally uh, quite uh, lackluster response to the French activation of Article uh, 42 2.7. So, you know, from the French uh, frame, from the French perspective, this is exactly what informs uh, a discussion about the uh, the European Army. Uh, then I could wax lyrical uh, about uh, how uh, any discussion of a EU army uh, would be seen uh, by politicians who are uh, in, you know who are being challenged uh, by uh, by nativist uh, forces, uh, by sovereignist uh, forces. Uh, this is anathema to uh, you know lots of uh, lots of. Um, political uh, developments. And actually, thirdly, uh, I think that this would uh, be more de detrimental uh, than we can think to uh, the vitality uh, of EU-NATO uh, cooperation. Uh, and I think, well, there is a growing level of comfort in the United States with uh, you know, a European uh, defense uh, developments because they are, at the end, beneficial uh, to, the, to, to, the, to NATO because we're still talking about a single set of forces. Uh, I think that a, that a European army, uh, which would be much more you know, bureaucrat bureaucratically difficult uh, to deal with, uh, as counterintuitive as it sounds, uh, would not be beneficial uh, in, in this sense. So uh, I'd rather we have, you know, I'd rather the, the continent shared uh, tactical and strategic airlift capabilities, ISR uh, capabilities, uh, next generation aircraft, UAVs, rather than uh, working towards a, uh, a European army. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for your questions. I think we have time for, uh, well, maybe just one of them. I'll, is there anyone else? Okay, sir. Just a, a quick comment and then a question for the panel. Um, the, the President's uh, criticism of European defense and spending is really old hat. I'm old enough to remember Senator Mark Ma Hatfield and Senator Mansfield complaining about the same things in the 60s. But that they came from that generation that believed the defense of Europe was in its enlightened self-interest. So it always balanced out. I just finished a book about, uh, writing a book about Nixon and European integration in the early 70s. And our conclusion was that while he hated to talk to Europe, he never hung up the phone. So I don't think that Washington is ever going to hang up the phone. But, but something bothers me. Before I came out, I looked at um, population growth in this neck of the woods. And since 1993, the Czech Republic and Slovakia have about the same population. Hungarian deputy counselor yesterday, the counselor deputy chief of mission, told me that the Hungarian population has been the same for the last 15 and 20 years. How are you going to buy new weapons with aging population and a shrinking tax base? It seems to me you got a problem here that's kind of the elephant in the room. I think it's a herd of elephants because it's it's not only about uh, the the money. Which, okay, uh, let me put this differently. Uh, if, if you, you mention uh, demographic uh, statistics, I can go over macroeconomic statistics which show that the Czech Republic and generally countries in the region have the highest growth rates uh, in the European Union, uh, constantly have had uh, budgetary uh, surpluses. Uh, Lukas Dicka was mentioning pay raises uh, in the army. Uh, we are in a country where 
on a political whim, uh, basically a very large amount of civil servants can receive a 10% pay raise. I remember that in France we fight for 0.25% uh, pay, pay raises. So the money uh, is, uh, is, is not the issue. In my mind, uh, the issue, and perhaps this is something that will be uh, discussed later, is actually the recruitment. Uh, this is perhaps the, the the biggest issue is really you know how to how to recruit uh, uh, officers uh, who also you know have uh, linguistic uh, capabilities. This is really the the main issue. And then of course there is an issue which I was alluding to uh, in my in my presentation is uh, you know the the the, the issue of uh, of making strategic choices for the future of the Czech Slovak uh, armed forces. But as a matter of fact, this is not uh, an issue that is unique to uh, to to the. Czech Republic. It's it's valid for lots of Central European countries. It's valid very much for uh, for for Germany, and it's also very much valid uh, for uh, for France. So, uh, in my mind, uh, the the issue is not entirely just linked uh, to money because the money uh, exists. Uh, and uh, there is a, a fairly robust plan in place to uh, increase the level of, of defense spending, at least in the Czech Republic. And uh, Prime Minister uh, Babish here uh, values uh, the, the, the armed forces, which are still viewed generally quite positively uh, by, the, uh, by the population. But it's just about this level of uh, political military uh, relations uh, and uh, basically how to uh, structure the, uh, the montée en puissance uh, of, the, of the Czech armed forces and how to do this smartly uh, in a regional uh, in a regional framework and this is why I uh, was calling in my paper for you know a very clear integration into European uh, processes which should be uh, compatible also with uh, NATO's uh, defense planning process thank you very much that was a brilliant comment and a brilliant question and I really love the answer I thought that I'll be descending on the level of manning and recruitment but in the end, you're really right that it's the, one of the pressing issues that we have in the armed forces, and I believe that it's not only the case of Czech Republic. I have the experiences from Hungarian Ministry of Defense, and they're facing the same problem as well. So, yeah, really, that's not just the elephant, but the herd of elephants in the in the in the in the, board, in, in the room. So, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that we have uh, last well, roughly 10 minutes, so that should uh, be good for my presentation. And I'll be talking about uh, the challenges that the Czech defense policy is facing and how do we react to them in, in the last years and what are we going to do in the, in the coming years. I think we, we all heard a lot about the threats that are uh, you know, felt in Czech Republic. You probably heard yesterday a lot about Russia. So I'm not going too deep into that. Uh, there is also migration that's a very prominent political topic in Czech Republic. Uh, even though there are no migrants in Czech Republic or no, not significant uh, amount, uh, the population is still afraid. So we need to deal with that as well. And the armed forces are reacting on that. And there is a threat of terrorism, of course. Even though it's uh, largely forgotten uh, in the last year or two, uh, it doesn't mean that it will not reappear in the future. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these more. I'm going to talk more about the reaction of the Czech Republic to them. And what's important and what's very significant for us, we started to increase the defense budget. So the money are there, as, as Martin mentioned. We have the money, and finally, after 28 years, we know who is the enemy. I think that's very positive in a way, uh, if you look at it from the defense policy perspective. However, if you have the money, uh, what are you going to do with them? You need to spend them, right? Because just having the money in your bank account doesn't really do much. You need to spend them. What are you going to spend them on? Uh, generally, you can spend them on three things. You can either spend them on personnel, Okay, that's good. Uh, and that's happening, and the soldiers got really huge pay raise during the last four years, uh, up until the point that now money are not really motivating new people to enter the armed forces because the, 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 the money are already, already quite, quite, uh, quite abundant. You can also spend the money on investments, uh, and that's not really happening in Czech Republic, and I'm going to be talking about that. And then you can, of course, and you need to spend the money on the running costs uh, because you need to feed the technology and you need to buy fuel and so on. Uh, which in Czech Republic we did a very positive steps in the past and we, need, we renewed all the strategic documents related to the defense policy. And that's a very positive step and we are doing it now again. We are working on the defense policy uh, or, or the armed forces defense uh, uh, concept and the development concept of the armed forces. So this is going to happen and it's happening right now and it will be uh, ready soon, I believe. Uh, but back to the 2% of the GDP. We promise that we will reach this level at uh, the year 2024. Uh, okay, that sounds very positive. Uh, but we were not able to buy anything and procure any new te te technology and any new equipment during the last four years. Uh, 
that means since the time we started to increase the defense budget. So the money are usually assigned to the Minister of Defense and at the end of the year the money goes back to the state budget. So even though the, the, the money in the defense uh, sector is, is uh, rising visibly, uh, it's not really having any impact. We were able, of course, to recruit more soldiers. Uh, up until 2014, we had the task to have 25,000 soldiers. Now we are supposed to have 30,000 soldiers, and we are able to recruit new soldiers. But there is a problem with it. Uh, with very steep rise in the numbers, of course, the quality of the new personnel is going down. And I hear the complaints from our platoon commanders and company commanders every day about the new soldier joining the army with having you know, a very strange motivations to join the army. Uh, they are really not that uh, physically healthy. They do not really fit the expectations that we would expect from the new soldiers. So with the rising amount of soldiers, of course, the quality is going down. And that's something to be expected. You can work on that to, to you know, improve the training. Uh, but it's going to take time. What is even more pressing problem, uh, though, I, I believe, is the lack of officers. Uh, you know, if you speak about the soldiers on the, on, the, on the basic levels, you can train them pretty fast and then you can uh, have them in the military for four to eight years and then again another people on the basic positions, that's good. But if you need, uh, need officers, their training and their education takes a tremendous amount of time and resources. And currently in the Czech Armed Forces there is over 1,000 positions, officer positions that are not filled meaning that there are thousands of officers missing. And what does it mean for the current officers in the armed forces? That they need to stand on their position for longer time. You cannot replace a, a company commander and then promote him because there is no other replacement for him. And that means that the armed forces are getting older and older and older. Uh, this year, I would like to know your opinion, but there is no time to ask. This year, the average uh, average age of the of the armed forces, of which age of the soldiers in the armed forces in the Czech Republic reached 38 years. I think that's really staggering. It's even worse for the civilians working in the in the defense sector in the Czech Republic, where the average age rose to 51 years, uh, while one third of the civilians working for the ministry is above 55 years old. I mean, I'm working for the Ministry of Defense, uh, so you can see that I'm really not that typical uh, Ministry of Defense employee, given my age. Uh, however, if you look on the new recruits for the armed forces, uh, I think there is a, a huge and depressing problem. The average year, uh, every average age of the new recruits is 27 years. Uh, it was last year. I think this year is going to be 28 years. And think about it. If you are 28 years old, and almost everyone has been in here in this room, uh, think about it. Are you willing to die for your country? Probably not. You want to have a house, you want to have family, you want to stay in one place. You don't want to really move when you are assigned to another position in another part of the Czech Republic. You don't want to go to the foreign missions that often because then you have family and you have kids. So again, the motivation of the new soldiers entering the military is rather worrying for me and I think that's a trend we need to take into account and it will change the motivation and it will change the functioning of the armed forces in the future. Now, that was about the personnel, a very important trend, and I was, I'm really glad that you started it without me and before me. Now, let's talk about the acquisitions. Uh, there is the NATO gui guideline that says that you should spend 20% of your defense budget on, on investments into new material. Uh, however, Czech Republic last year promised to the U.S. partners that we are going to spend 30% of the defense budget on investments. I mean, technically, that's possible, and it's happening in small countries, such as Baltic states. Uh, but we are not that small country and the army is not that small as the Estonian or Lithuanian. And if you spend 30% on investments in the future and if you keep the spending for five years, it means that you will have running costs increasing rapidly. Uh, there is a story, I believe, uh, something about that if you want a mon monkey, you need to have money for bananas and the more, the more monkeys you have, the more bananas you need to buy. And that's the same case with the, with the military systems. The more, more military or, or defense systems you buy, the more money you have to put in that in the future. And I think there's a ticking bomb in our, in our room for the, for the next uh, decade or two. So we will be spending money, but I'm afraid that we will overheat the, the, the acquisition process. The question is, why are we doing that? And I think it's uh, largely because, of course, the threat of Russia, but on the other hand, also the push from the uh, American President Trump. And in order to look good for the American allies, we may overheat the acquisition system, and that may cause tremendous problem in the future. And coupled with the, uh, with the ineffective recruitment system and the uh, lowering quality of the personnel, that could cause in 10 to 15 years uh, problems for the whole Czech military, and in that case, of course, for the Czech Republic as well. I think the time has run, up, uh, run out, uh, so I will stop here. Uh, if there is any question for me, I'll be very happy to answer it.
and I don't see anyone uh, because you probably wait for the coffee, and I agree. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you for the for the speakers here in in the floor. Uh, it was really pretty pretty interesting to listen to this global perspective, uh, and I'm truly happy to to be here with you. So enjoy the rest of the day, and goodbye. <laughs>